Turn our okay, we are on. recording now. And we have the pleasure of having an additional recording from Bert Romberg, B-E-R-T-R-O-M-B-E-R-G, and his wife, Terry Romberg. And how long have y'all been married? 66 years. And when did you get married? What, what is your anniversary? Ju July 7. 1957. And where did you get married? Uh, Larchmont, New York. And why Larchmont, New York? It's where Terry's aunt and uncle had a very nice house. They lent their house for our wedding. And what is your aunt, Terry, what is your aunt and uncle's Name? It was Ruth and Larry Sobel. What's the last name? Sobel, S-O-B-E-L. In Larchmont, New York. Very nice. How many people were at your wedding? About 60. Maybe 60, 50 to 60. Oh, by the way, okay. I'm, I'm the interviewer. I'm Fonda Arbetter, by yes. the way. I forgot to mention my name. <clears throat> okay, and um, Bert. I know you were on the Kinder Transport with your sister Maggie first, F-U-R-S-T, and how old were you? Eight. Not quite nine, eight. And um, can you tell me your parents' names? Mother was Sita Romberg, born Rothschild. And how do you spell her first name? S-I-D-A. Sida. And where did y'all live? We, were, we lived in a small village called Ostheim. Spell that. A-S-T-H-E-I-M. Ostheim where? It's, in, it's a little village in the... In the uh, armpit of where the Rhine meets the Main, the two main rivers. The, the and what country? Germany. In Germany. You're born in Germany. And what is your birth date? July 17, 1930. Okay. And you had Maggie as a sister. And did you have any other siblings? No. Maggie's a year older than I am. Okay. And what is your father's name? was Alfred. Alfred Romberg. And it was Romberg in Germany and Romberg in America? He didn't survive. He died in 1934. No. Was that the, your name in Germany? Romberg? Yeah, Romberg. Right. It wasn't changed or anything? Uh, Terry, what, um, when were you born? January 31st, 1936. And where were you born? Canada. Where in Canada? Toronto, Canada. Toronto, Canada. And what were your parents' names? I do not know. I was adopted. Oh, that's very interesting. And how old were you when you were adopted? 18 months. And what are your adopted parents' names? I don't remember. Okay. Okay, and when... when you're adopted. Oh, my adopted parents, June and Mervyn Klinger. K-L-I-N-G-E-R. And you grew up in Toronto? No, uh, until I was 18 months, I was living with foster parents. That's what I thought you were asking. Um, but um, I was adopted from those foster parents to an American couple. And their name were Klinger? And they brought you to what? New York City. New, so did you... How long did you live in New York City? That time, I don't remember. But we lived in New York, and then we moved up to Westchester, and then we moved back to Manhattan, and then we moved out to Long Island. <laughs> so I've been living all over New York. What did your adopted father do? He was an insurance salesman for a while. He was a car salesman. So he was in sales? Yes. 
And Bert, what did your father do for a living before the war? Before the war? Uh, <clears throat> I don't know for sure. We do know that he was a severely wounded World War I veteran in the Kaiser's army. Oh, I'm sorry, which? In, in the German army. How do you World. spell that? The German army. No, the, you said Kaiser. Kaiser. Ka oh, the Kaiser <clears throat> was the German king. And it, he and was a his, king in Germany? Yes. Okay, a little, little world history. Okay. The First World War was, was triggered by some rivalries between governments and between the rulers of the European nations at the time. And the German government was supposedly a republic. It wasn't really a republic, it was a monarchy. And the Kaiser was the king. Okay. And your father served in the in Kaiser the, army uh, for in, Germany yes. in World War I. And tell me about his injury. Well, I don't know much about his injury. We, but, but we, we, because I was not, I was three years old when he when he died. So I didn't <coughs> didn't know him very well. I have very vague memories of him. Sister Maggie will know more about him. She was one year older. But we are the pictures we have of him. I think I can only one picture where he wasn't holding or walking with a cane. So that we we know that his legs were in trouble. And, 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 but as far as what he did for a living, in last time my grandfather, my, my, on my maternal side, <coughs> my mother's father. I need his name. Benjamin you, Rothschild. Okay. Uh, had established and built a, a very nice, very comfortable living for us. He, he was the, in this village, he was the uh, general store, or the farm and ranch store. Your mother's father? Yeah. The, the, where we lived was in the Rhineland, which people will recognize geographically. Um, very, very rich, not rich, very fertile. Fertile. Uh, farming area irrigated by the two main rivers in Germany. Got it. And he had, he built very good relations with the farming community. He supplied them their, their seed, their, their, their tools. He lent them money to start their crops and their cattle. Um, so he had quite a Prosperous. And there was there was no like anti-Semitism back then in the early there, 1900s. There always was. Anti-Semitism was is always there. We didn't know it. Little village, two Jewish families, ours and the Strausses, and maybe uh, 200 families altogether. But everybody so, got along. Yeah. So that, that was until the early 1930s. By that time, my father had moved from the, where his family was, more in central Germany, uh, to marry my mother. So the I guess technically he he helped run the business. I doubt whether he was very capable physically. How did your parents meet? I don't have a clue. That's <clears throat> we don't know that. Okay, let's skip to uh, 
how your mother was able to put you and Maggie on a kinder transport. Okay, let's go back a little bit. Okay. Maggie was born in 29. I was born in 30. Depression era. Hmm? Depression in America. Yep. Um, <clears throat> that's what I'm coming to. Depression everywhere. The, uh, and grandfather died shortly after Maggie was born. Depression area. Depression era. Era. Not so much in us time. Us time always managed to feed itself. But in surrounding bigger towns, unemployment, etc., etc. Uh, mother was the third child of four, two older sisters and a younger brother. Okay. But the last one remaining home. The other three were either married and living in bigger cities or like the younger brother had moved to Frankfurt for career. Reasons. Can you give me your aunts and uncles' names? Oldest aunt and uncle were Jacob and Irene Solomon. Spell that. S-A-L-O-M-O-N, Solomon. Okay, that's your oldest aunt? Yeah. Irene was my mother's oldest sister. Middle one, the next one was, was uh, Irina and Paula, Paula Wolf, W-O-L-F-F. -F. And that's their married names? Yes. Solomon and Wolf. Okay. Paula lived in another town called Eschwege with and was already married, had, had children by then. The younger brother, er, er, Ernest Rothschild, at that time was not married but was engaged to uh, Gretel. Grumbacher. Gretel Grumbacher. G R U M B A C H E R. Okay. What happened to those families? Uh, Irene and Jacob got to New York, left Germany fairly early, middle 30s. The Wolf family was split up by the Nazis. Uh, Kurt, the father, my uncle, in law. Right. Uncle by marriage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And his son managed to get out on the theory that they would go and establish themselves in America and then send for Irene and the daughter. Oh, your cousin. Co the send cousin. for Paula and daughter Margo. That never happened. Because those two women got trapped. Uncle Ernie, the youngest, the brother, eventually married Gretel, who, who was a nurse, and was able to go to England on her visa because the British needed nurses. Got it. So they got out. Got it. And eventually came to America and eventually settled in South Jersey and became chicken farmers. Nice. Yep. Okay. What happened to your mother? Well, the mother. Okay, that's that's a good story. It's one of the good stories of the Kinder Transport. My parents got married in twenty-seven. Okay. And the the reason I mention it was is because. We have their wedding picture, and in that wedding picture is a little guy standing in the back who got to England. 
very early, in the, in the very early 30s, and, and established himself, became reasonably prosperous, and in the scramble for German Jewish people to get out, most of them couldn't. Most countries didn't want refugees, but he managed with a lawyer and some money maybe in Britain to get her a visa to go to Britain. And it arrived, she got that visa in 1938, just at the time that the kinder transport was forming. And we think, although we don't know for sure, <clears throat> but she got on the train with us. Whether she got on as a chaperone officially, we don't know. But Your mother. She, yeah, but she, in effect, she acted, I guess, as a chaperone for all these kids. And, but, and she was, she had a visa and she was able to stay in England. There were other chaperones that didn't have a visa, they had to go back. Let me just make sure I have this clear. It's important. Let me make sure I have this clear. Tell me one more time who got to England and established themselves. A, a cousin, younger cousin of my mother. Okay. A first cousin? Yes. His name was Lowenthal, Leventhal, and that branch of my mother's family, uh, eventually some others of that branch got out to England and also became reasonably prosperous. Spell that last name. Lowenthal, L-O-W-E-N-T-H-A-L. Okay, and that's your mother's first cousin and he got to England right? and, and was able to get your mother there. Right. So. By luck, the timing, I mean, nothing that we could do about it, it just so happened. Time-wise, that visa showed up. Time-wise, the, the kinder transport trains were loading up at, at two stations in, in, in Berlin and in Frankfurt. And we were reasonably close to Frankfurt. So I guess she managed to get us there and got on, got on the train with us. Were you and Maggie, like, upset to leave your homes? Or did you follow your mom and your mom said, come? Did you leave That's behind not, a lot that you were upset about? We weren't upset. We left behind a lot. We left grandmother, we left Aunt Paula and cousin Margot. We didn't know how serious her, that her was. Her mother, your mother's mother. Yeah, my, my, my mother's mother, my, my grandmother. An eight-year-old doesn't know or, or seldom knows how serious outside conditions are. I mean, had we been molested, had we been bombed, had we been arrested, we wouldn't know, but none of that happened to us. Okay? So you, so we thank were, God your mother knew what to do. Yep, that you're common, common sense lady. We gotta get out of here any which way. So where in England did y'all go? Okay, her, her visa, written quite plainly, and I didn't bring it, but I can get you a copy, states, uh, I'm quoting pretty accurately, it says, refugee, it has her name, it also has my name, and Maggie as her children. That visa covered three of us. Uh, 
it states very clearly, refugee as a condition of your entry into the United Kingdom, you will accept employment only as a only you will accept employment only in a as a domestic in a household. Nice words for Mrs. Romberg. If you come to England, you have to work. The only work you can take, you can accept, is as a housemaid. Okay. And did she get employment as a domestic? Immediately. And who did she work for? Some rich family in North London. We don't know. Because when we got there, the kinder transport took us. Because she, her, I guess her reasoning, out, we never talked to her about this, or she never talked to us about it. Her reasoning probably was, what household is going to take me with two small house kids? So she turned us over to the kinder transport, who found foster homes for us in, in a town called Coventry in central England, where uh, I was for the next three years and Maggie was for the next four and a half, five years with local families who fostered us. Uh not uh, Jewish families? I was with a non-Jewish family, Maggie was with a Jewish family. And y'all never lost touch, you and Maggie? We, we, didn't, <clears throat> we didn't see a lot of each other, but we didn't lose touch. You knew where each other was? Mostly, yes, mostly, not all the time. And But y'all were on the same kinder transport to get to Coventry. To co get to Coventry, and okay. Now, can we talk about getting to America? Too soon. Let's talk about. Did you and Maggie come at the same time to America? Yes. And you have that part of the story. How y'all made it to America? No, you have that part of the story after we got to America. How we made it to America was pretty simple. <clears throat> it's simple to tell. In England, you had a society similar to Hyas here. Yes. Which was called, it, it was in effect the Jewish refugee resettlement effort. It's called Bloomsbury House only because it was located in Bloomsbury, which was a, is a, is a borough of London. Got it. Okay. At Bloomsbury House, I guess at the time, after Maggie, uh, after we had, Maggie was in, in Coventry with a family called Simon, a Jewish family. Didn't treat her all that well. Uh, had two older children of their own, a merchant, fairly prosperous family, but they basically, by the time she was 11 and a half or 12, they had made her into a housemaid. And your family treated you better? The family I was with, the non Jewish family, were wonderful. What were their names? Shepherd. Harold and Miriam Shepherd. And what did Harold Shepherd do? He was a mail postman, a mail carrier. Did they have any other children? Also had two children. Peter, about a year and a half, two years older than me, and Mary, maybe two years older than him. And they treated you just like you were part of the family? They, they embraced me. They, 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 part of the, the, the ability of the kinder transport to organize and to 
bring kids to England was the bargain that the organizers, which was really the Quakers, a, a, Christian, a small Christian sect, in conjunction with these refugee societies, had appealed to Parliament, British, the British Parliament, to let refugees from Germany come in without all the formalities of visa and you name it all, uh, in a time when there was depression. Wow. And, and the British, the, the British was the, the, England was the first of the big trade union countries. Okay. And the union said, oh, we don't have enough jobs, don't bring any refugees in here. So Parliament resisted any kind of immigration. But, but the, the uh, organizers, and particularly the Quakers, because of their standing in British society, which was pretty high, they have a wonderful reputation managed to get a small bargain from Parliament which said, okay, you can bring kids in here, 15 and younger, because they're not going to take our jobs. And 10,000 children were able to come? Well, I told Gentiles wanted to leave Germany. The, the now, how many people were able to... All, all together. On the kinder transport? Just, about 10,000. 10,000. That's a round number, but it's close. So England absorbed 10,000 children 15 yeah. years old and under. Right. Okay. Okay. With the caveat that the families that took these children in fed them, educated them, so that the, the government did not have to do this. Well, yeah, the government said, you, you guys bring these kids in but it's up to you to feed them, house them, clothe them, educating, educate them at no cost to the British treasure. And you went to school? Oh yeah. And do you still keep up with the children, or did you keep up with the children of the Shepherd family? For a while we did, yes. We lost track, I think the last one, probably 20 years ago. Um, ben would be the grandchild of, of the family that adopted me or fostered me. Yeah. So how long did you stay in England? Altogether, we stayed six years. Okay. Now tell me. Let can we move to? you coming to America, and let's talk about how you got associated with, commer with commercial metals. Oh, okay. We, we came to America in 19... You and Maggie came together. We came with together. With your mother. Yeah. That was with your mother. Courtesy of Bloomsbury House, who organized everything. Got us transport, put us on the... on the... on the... Uh, ship. Oh, what ship? Didn't your aunt and uncle get the visas for you? Didn't Raina and Curtis get the visas for you? They got the visas, but then arranging the transport and paying for it and so <coughs> on and so forth. Um, it's a good thing that you came along. Yeah, I want to know. Yeah, well, the, 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 while we were in England, uh, by then, Aunt Uncle Jake and, and Aunt Irene were living in New York. And they contacted some kind of Washington attorney who worked on getting us a visa from England to America. And that, that was during the war, during the Second World War. And that visa showed up in 19, late 1944. In other words, we and by the time the Bloomsbury House could make the arrangements, by the time the, the uh, 
American consulate in England actually issued the visa. It was early 1945, and we came on a, on a ship called the the Aquitania. It was the sister ship of the Lusitania. Wow. It, do you know what the Lusitania Yes, of course. Was? Yeah. It was a passenger liner that the British and the Canadian governments had taken over as and converted into a troop ship for Canadian troops to go to Europe and then bring them home later on. And we and, and Bloomsbury House <coughs> arranged for passage on the Aquitaine, a, a cabin, two cabins actually, on the Aquitania for refugees like us coming from England to America. And you were in the very bottom of the ship? Sort of, yeah. Um, so you basically spent most of World War II. All of it. All of World War II in England when you were being bombed. Yes. Did you see bombs or hear bombs? Or? Yes. yes, yes, yes. Did they ever get close to you? Yes. Pretty close, yes. But, well, Coventry, you, Coventry, you don't know, but you should know, is, is a, a major industrial city. It was like the Detroit of England. It's where the, England made its motor cars. So it was a major war materials manufacturing center. And so it, was it a, a, a target for Germany? It was the first and the main target in Germany to be blitzed. That must have been and really scary. Not to not, a not for a nine-year-old. Uh -uh. We we got along, but <clears throat> but it but it was very influential in what happened to particularly to me and to a lesser degree to Maggie, uh, because I got there when I was not quite nine. We got there in in uh, June, late June of nineteen thirty. Nine and my birthday is in July, so I was nine in July. By the time I was um, settled into life with the shepherds and schooling and all of that, but by the time I was nearly twelve, or was twelve, and, and Coventry had been severely bombed, the the, the shepherds among being very, very good to me, were very conscientious of my being Jewish, made sure I went to Hebrew school, made sure I went to the synagogue, etc., etc. So they accommodated all of that. Um, but the Blitz destroyed the, the synagogue and dispersed the Jewish community. So I guess the rabbi was a chaplain in the army. The Hebrew, the Hebrew school teacher was probably in the navy or, or whatever. And Mama realized that here I'm coming up for my bar mitzvah and no place to learn. So she went back to Bloomsbury House. This story we do know. She went back to Bloomsbury House. We're live. Okay. The the the. Uh, so what went, about your bar mitzvah? Yeah, she went back to Bloomsbury House to ask them to, to find a place where I could learn from my bar mitzvah, and they found a place <clears throat> in a small or a smaller community in in Hartford, which is the north. The, Hertfordshire is the northern bordering county to London, a fairly rural community. Hurry up. Hmm? Hurry up. <laughs> and there, there they, they found. In Hartford was the, Jew, the Jewish orphanage, a very prestigious small orphanage, well-funded, 
moved from London to get their kids out of the Blitz to Hartford. And they had a rabbi and... They had, they had a complete Jewish environment that they picked up and moved with the exception that in, in London they had their own dormitory and accommodations. In Hartford, the kids had to be boarded out on local citizens. And how, how were, what was, were there cars? No, no, no. no. How, how, did, how did you uh, uh, commute? We didn't, we didn't commute. I know, from... We walked. Just, <laughs> we, or bicycle. We, 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 if, if there were bicycles available, we didn't have cars. I didn't know if the shepherds, you know, well, shepherds, drove you. The shepherds didn't have a car. We walked or we bore. The shepherds were so good to me that when I got there, they, they arranged for me to be integrated with the local kids up the street and so on. And when one of the one of these children went to visit grandma in the countryside or whatever, they would ask if if they could borrow his bicycle so I could learn how to ride a bike. So that was your mode of transportation, was bicycle or walk? If we had, that's right, exactly. Uh, and for the most part, and people... Excuse me, but it was the Pettits in, in Hartford. Yeah, well, we'll go back. Okay, so we so got back in Hartford. I landed with a family called Pettit. Uh, who at the time had an infant child. And that's spelled P-E-T-I-T. T-I-T. Uh, and it was, her name was Gwen. And his was Pop. Pop, yeah, <laughs> it was Pop. Pop and Gwen Pettit. Right. And they kept you while you studied for your bar mitzvah. They kept me for the next three years. Wow. Uh, That's amazing. And, and they too were very, very good to me. They, so you got very fortunate. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about uh, your adult life and uh, your college and uh, how you became associated with commercial metals and the history of commercial metals and, and your um, employment there. Okay, let, let's, let's start in, in Hartford, where I, I did very well at the, at the orphanage. I, I wasn't... Honey, skip it. Okay. No, no, I, no. I got a very good education there. I, I got a scholarship to a, 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 an upscale high school, like the beginning of the British university system, and attended there for my secular education, but stayed with the orphanage for my religious education. Got it. So that, that was a good life for me. And But mom, I think, was anxious to reunite with her family. And the only ones that were sort of capable of doing that were, was Irene and Jacob in New York, and they got the visa, and we eventually went to New York. So in New York, I, I went into, into uh, sophomore, middle sophomore year, Jamaica High School. In okay. Jamaica, Queens. Okay. Did okay. Did fine. Mama right away went to work in the garment district as a seamstress. Okay. As a sewing machine operator. Uh, I went to high school daytime. Got my first afternoon and evening job, one of very many. Doing what? Doing anything I could earn a nickel on. Okay. Uh, several. In, in a space. From, I got there when I was 14 in the space of oh, three, four years. I probably, or oh, five years, I probably had 
10 different part-time jobs. Got it. During high school and during the first year of college, Maggie immediately went to night school and got a day job in New York as it began to work as a dental assistant. Okay. Okay. So and we lived in Jamaica, New York. Got it. Originally, we couldn't afford an apartment. I lived <coughs> with, by that time, the younger brother, Uncle Ernie, also lived in Jamaica. I, I lived with them on their front porch on a pull-out couch. Got it. And Maggie and Mommy lived in a furnished room. Got it. In the next block. And we lived that way for the first two years, I guess. I'm not quite sure. But by then, Maggie was 14, 15, 16. Anyway, and we finally got a uh, small apartment, the three of us, a few years, you know, a couple of years later. I finished high school, 1948, and went to Queens College. What did you think about Israel being formed in 1948? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that. I, I don't, we were on the periphery of, of that event. It was big news. Oh yeah. Uh, okay, so and you... Then, and then Maggie got married, very young, 19 I think she was, to a World War II veteran, very nice guy and moved into a smaller apartment of their own. And Mom and I had this apartment until she got ill. Her mother. And couldn't work anymore, and I had to go to switch from day school to night school. By then it's 1950, and Korea break, the Korean War breaks out. And by then I'm 20, and the draft board is calling for me. Why? Because I'm no longer in college. I'm no full longer time. a full-time student. No more deferral. Bingo. And what did you do in the Korean War? Well, I first fought the draft war for about a year, saying, "I can't. You can't take me. I'm a, a I'm, immigrant. I'm, no, I'm, I'm not an immigrant, but I'm supporting my mom on part-time jobs." And, you know, had, had a, finally they said, ah, oh, you've got to come. Why? We need 50,000 draftees a year. Uh, 50, we have, we've got to have you. And anyway, the army will give you an allowance for your dependent. So I got drafted in 51. But you weren't in any of the, um, did you see... What are well, I, eventually I got basic training, some additional training, then they sent me to Korea. To, and they sent me to Korea, this is a quirky thing, I guess the army did many times. I'm a German refugee, I'm a fluent German speaker, they sent me to Korea. When they had a, a large garrison still in Germany and sent these kids from Kentucky to language school at Fort Ord in California to learn German to go that way. But that's okay. So, so you was, survived the war? Sure. I was in Korea for 13 months and did very well. I got out with five stripes, sergeant first class. Uh, came home, end of 1953 and uh, had a brilliant army career and I thought I was ready to, well the world was waiting for me. Take on the world. They, they, they didn't, they weren't waiting for me so I couldn't find a decent job. So I was banging around 
New York trying to get hired somewhere, I finally decided I was eligible for the GI Bill. Okay. And I could get a part-time job with the GI Bill and a part-time job and free public education. New York City school system, uh, college system. College. So I, I took an entrance exam and got an, eventually got an engineering degree, which was very, very beneficial, although I never used it as an engineer. But career-wise, later on, it was very, very helpful. All right, how did you get associated with commercial metals? Salami. Okay. Okay. <laughs> got it. When I was in Korea, all these German refugees that we were part of the New York milieu, and particularly friends of my personal friends of my mother, many of them had sent me care packages in to Korea. You know, the salamis, the German chocolate, and all that. Wow. And uh, so when I, in addition to looking for work in New York, I, I, while I was doing that, I visited these people <clears throat> to thank them for being so kind to me while I was overseas. And I walked into Aunt Selma's apartment in New York, and sitting there was a guy called uh, Harry Schoenfeld. Harry Schoenfeld was a German refugee, had come to America early in the 30s with background in the scrap business. Got a job with Jake Feldman. He was Aunt Selma's Wait, brother in law. Harry Schoenfeld. How did he know Jake Feldman? He was working for him. Harry was working for Jake Feldman, he and Jake in, Feldman was where? Here in Dallas. Okay, and Harry was working up there? No. Harry, Harry was working for Jake Feldman's Fort Worth scrapyard. And you saw him in New York? Yeah. What was he doing there? Harry didn't travel, didn't fly. And Jake had sent some scrap to Germany and there were problems with it. Evidently he had some kind of quality claim, whatever it was. And Jake sent Harry to Germany to settle it. And we got a problem, go to Germany and settle it. Harry didn't fly. So he took the train from Fort Worth to New York. It was with his sister-in-law, Aunt Selma, my mother's best friend, waiting for the boat to go to Hamburg. And he said, kid, what are you doing? I said, I'm looking for work. He said, here, write to Jake Feldman. There it is. That's the answer. <laughs> he said, no. It's a, read it. It says, no. Here, read, read this. You read it. Okay, it says, Dear Mr. Romberg, and this letter is from Commercial Metals, dated January 20th, 1954. It says, Dear Mr. Romberg, acknowledge your application, and we will certainly keep you in mind as soon as we have room to start another trainee. We regret that we are unable to invite you to come down at once, but in view of present circumstances, we think it may be a little while before we can consider adding another trainee to our program. We will keep your application before us and hope that before too long, we will be following this matter up in an effort to have you come with us. With best wishes, we are sincerely yours, Commercial Medals, Jake Feldman. Wow. And the address... Um, the address of Commercial Metals was Latimer at Corinth. I guess that's Good Latimer now, huh? Good Latimer and Corinth. That's where their original offices were. Oh, yeah. Wow. And it says, um, yeah, da they were at the time in Dallas, Beaumont, 
Fort Worth, Houston, San Antonio, and St. Louis. Yep. And this is again January 20th, 1954. Now, Uh, and on the back of this framed uh, letter, uh, dated June 5th, 1995, uh, a uh, Western Union telegram says, it is with great sorrow that we have to inform you that Jake Feldman died today. He was the founder of our company and an inspiration to those of us who had the privilege of working with him. Wow. June 5th, 1995. Now, Tell me in between 1954, uh, tell me in 1954, uh, when did they eventually uh, tell you to come on down? Two years later. December, Christmas, New Year's break, 1954. That's so two years. And uh, you were just still trying to find your way. By then, I, I had almost two years at engineering school. And by then, and, that, and two weeks after that, I met this lady. Where? In New York. Where? She was, by then, they were living in, in Hewlett, on Long Island, in Nassau County. And uh, did you meet at a party? Did, were you introduced? I'll let you tell it. Terry, tell me. It was a put-up job. A, set, a, a, a blind date? <laughs> yes, a blind date arranged by his sister and his mother and my aunt. Now, in Germany, my mother-in-law had befriended a young woman, who was maybe 16, 17, who had just lost her mother, and they lived in the same apartment building. She was with her father, and Maggie with Burrow with her mother. She was sent, this uh, Joan, my aunt, was sent to New York by her father. His wife had passed away and he had no reason to stay. He said he packed everything he could, sent her and all of the belongings that he could to New York. Well, I don't know how she ended up in Washington, D.C., but she ended up in Washington, D.C. She had 18 years old, had nothing, no education, nothing. She became a barmaid in a, in a beer joint. Luckily, the, the owner of the, uh, of the uh, bar, uh, his wife, took her under his, her wing, mm -hmm. mothered her, and eventually got her up to New York. For some reason, she made her way up to New York. She found a job in a very, very nice women's, um, uh, women's store, Home? dress store, oh. and she became friendly with three of the women that worked there. They happened to be very good friends in the same crowd that my father was attached to. She fell in love with my father's brother. They got married, and on their fifth anniversary, she wanted to have a party, and they were living in a very, very small apartment. She asked my mother, can we use your house to have my fifth anniversary party? My mother said yes. They had their party there, Maggie, my, my mother-in-law, <laughs> met me, and Maggie says, that's someone for Bert. <laughs> and then two years later, he finally got my telephone number from, I don't know, if it, from my aunt or from Maggie or from my mother-in-law, but two years later he called me. Lucky you were still available. I was still, I was very young. When they met me, I was 18, I think, or 19. And you went to college for one year. Where did you go? New York State, um, well, I took an uh, advertising art and design at New York State um, a Technical Institute. It was a long name <laughs> in Farmingdale, New York. Okay, so you finally called there, y'all met, you got married, and um, you weren't with Commercial Metals yet. No, I wasn't. I yes. was in school and part-time job. Okay. <clears throat> I had you a year. Met, you met me the same week you went to the commercial medals. Yeah. That was a lucky week. It was a big week. Big week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was Christmas. That was winter break. And y'all got married in July of the next year. Yeah, I, I, it was another time because by then Maggie and Harry were living in their, 
we had this little apartment, my mom and I. Uh, I had I was out of the army. Mama was living with Maggie. And uh, let's see. Yeah. So I was still going to school, but Mama got ill again, and I had to go to night school. I, I needed to find a job, a full-time job. And I got a phone call from Commercial from, Metals. Who actually called you from Commercial Metals? In the meantime, between that, that date on that letter and 1955, end of 1955, Jake had opened a small liaison sales office in New York. Two guys, one from New York and one he sent up from Dallas, and the secretary or a gopher or something, as a sales liaison office, because the geography of the scrap metal business was such that most of the non-ferrous business, yes. non-ferrous means yes. for aluminum, everything except steel, was consumed by a factory complex in an area from Chicago to St. Louis to Baltimore, in the Northeast. So Jake decided, since we ship all our material up there anyway, send somebody up there to talk to the consumers who took our goods. So did Harry remind them about you? Well, no, I, I don't know how that happened, but that copy, well, they of, kept a letter on copy, copy of that correspondence must have been in Dallas, must have been with a, a man called, called Tom Kleiman, Jake's longtime friend and treasurer. In Dallas? In Dallas. Uh, is that K-L-E-I-M? Yeah. A-N? A -N? Um, he must have kept records or whatever. Uh, so they called me and I just needed a job. So it was anyway interim between... College? Uh, yeah, it was winter break. So I switched to night school and took the day job. How'd you like it? Well, I liked it because it was a full-time job. Uh, it was a part-time, it was a, uh, a, a trial basis, I think, 55 cents or 65 cents an hour. And, and I was with them for 45 years. Nobody ever told me when the trial was over. <laughs> so it, it, was a, it was a glamorous job. So how long did you stay in New York and how did you end up coming to well, Dallas? We stayed in New York. That was, that was the beginning of 56. Okay. Uh, we courted for a year and a half, got married in 57. And in the meantime, Jake had bought a little scrap yard in Philadelphia and needed to staff it. So, so you moved from New York to fi Philadelphia? In 58, they in, moved They up. let you finish night school? Yeah, they let me finish night school. As soon as I finished... Off to Philadelphia? Up to, to Philadelphia. And uh, how long were you in Philadelphia? Almost two years. And you took to it well? You enjoyed the work? We loved Philadelphia because it was an easier place to live. It was less expensive. We made very good friends, Jewish friends. We lived in a, we got an apartment in what's called a fourplex, where the landlord, the, the owner of the four units, he rented one to us and two on the other side, and he slept, he and his wife slept above us. Very nice arrangement, we could afford it. It was, we didn't have to face the long commutes in New York, we just loved it. We fell in with a Jewish crowd, got acquainted with a very nice, good rabbi. Uh, we love Philadelphia. And how long did you stay in Philadelphia? Not quite two years. Not quite two years. And how did you end up moving out of Philadelphia? 
When I was in New York, the uh, Jake on the way back from Israel stopped in New York and went to visit his office, his new office. In and Philadelphia? No, in New York. I'm oh, the new back. one in He's New going York. Back. He's going back. And, and uh, this one guy who lived in it, who, the New Yorker, he lives, no, they both live in the northern suburb of New York and they, they have to take the train in from to Grand Central and then the subway down to the office. They were always late. And Jake showed up. In front, early. <laughs> early, in front of the door. He's standing there when I'm the only one who has the key. I'm the only one early enough to let him in because I have the key. And he remembered that. And when he needed somebody in Dallas, he thought of me. And what job did he offer you in Dallas to get you to move? Assistant, a trainee and assistant to the manager of the metal department. Manager of the not ferrous department of the company. Company operationally was, or commercially, not operationally, commercially where we marketed our material was divided into steel and non ferrous. Got it. And a guy called Florsheim, elderly gentleman. Also German. Also a German refugee, was managing the non ferrous department. And Jake, and he had worked for Jake for quite a while. Jake paid very well by letting he was quite independent. And always, well to do. And always argued with, always had falling out with Jake. They were always arguing. And I guess Jake... Walter, let me just say that Walter had almost a photographic memory. And he kept everything here. Nothing was written down. So Jake put him to try to, yeah. to make something. I think Jake was afraid that Walter would walk out on him, <laughs> and he wouldn't have anybody there. So he needed a trainee behind Walter. So they called for me, and, I, and my job was to train on a Walter. We had a small office, Walter. And to document everything. Sort of, I guess. I didn't know it at the time, but but Walter had a, a desk there and I had a desk here and, and they arranged for me to have a listener phone so I heard all these conversations. Secretly? No, not secretly, just to back him up. It was wonderful training for me, wonderful. And it actually scared me a bit because here's this guy who never took a note. He carried everything in his vest pocket, you know. And I say, I could never do that, but it turns out you can train for that. You can actually, if, you, if you're in the middle of it and you take it seriously, you can learn to memorize things. So, so after a while I got used to it. And then, for me, fortunate but unfortunately, I was there about a year and a half and Walter had a massive heart attack. So here I was, you know, the new guy on the block, new kid on the block, having to manage the, well, I did manage the metal department right away. Jake jumped, jumped in and managed me and I managed the department. So I got another year of training directly under Jake, which was fabulous. And by then, had you had children? By no. then we had our when we moved to Dallas, I was seven and a half months pregnant. Yeah. With your oldest, <laughs> yes. who is? Paula. Paula, she's the oldest. Right. Okay, so you, you had to move your whole household mm -hmm. to Dallas in your third trimester. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Okay, and you went to work right away. Uh, I mean, the next morning. The next, the next day. morning. He left me sitting on the corner right, in Dallas. Right under Jake. Well, under Walter. Under Walter. And then later on. Under and Jake. then, okay. So let's fast forward. Um, uh, let's talk about um, you. You had told me. You had told me earlier. Uh, 
some background on commercial metals, like with St. Louis and... Well, yeah. Well, at that time, you see that letterhead. We probably had in four yards, four or five yards, and two offices, Dallas and St. Louis. Uh, we probably had 500 employees. Was and Jake started from scratch. Not exactly. The, the story I heard in the Depression, Jake's daddy was already in the scrap business. And what was his name? Moses. Moses Feldman. Feldman. Moses Feldman. Moses Feldman had four children. The oldest was David. The next was Fanny, Fanny Shannon. And the next was Jake, and the youngest was was uh, Bessie. Bessie is another story I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, Later. The the, uh, the oldest, David, for a while worked in the scrap business that the old man had founded and had gotten fairly prosperous. But according to what I later found out in talking to, to Robert Feldman, that the old man had speculated in, co in copper and the depression ruined the business. And then the old man got ill or got sick and Jake took over, and Jake rescued the business. It's the same story, that, true or not true, but the story was that Jake went to the First National Bank, and they said, we'll support you in one way or another, and they did. And he brought it out and, 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 and became viable during the Depression and became fairly wealthy during the Second So Jake World. basically learned the business from his father yeah. who made a bad investment well, uh, in copper. Yeah, I think so. That, that's the story that I heard about the actual founding of commercial metals. So, because the old man, to... when the old man built it, it was called American Iron and Metal which is the yard at Latimer and Corinth, and you probably remember seeing the sign. Yeah. Because behind, at, Yeah, it's on the street behind us. Yeah, behind them was Ablons the Chicken Flickers. Oh, wow. Am I right? What was it? Ablon. Ablon Chicken. The Ablon family. I know the Ablon family, but I don't know their business. They had chicken. Their, their chicken farm. And they were right... Right behind... Right behind... The chickens used to roost in the scrapyard. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So, so what position did you hold? Uh, how did you rise up in commercial metals? Well, it turns out that Jake began to trust me to run the metal department, the marketing side, with not as tight a supervision as, because he, he was busy. He was all over the world, all over Jewish affairs. He was in Israel. He was in Federation, he was a busy, busy, busy guy. So he, he began to loosen up and let me be, begin to trade and to market the material on my own. And then Jake and, and, and uh, another name, Morzell, became very, very good friends. And Jake moved into Morzell's new office building on South Ackett Street. Mm -hmm. We had part of the top floor. And, Jake, and Morris was very influential in how Jake ran his big commercial affairs and persuaded Jake to take it public. Just like Morris had taken the Zell Corporation public. Not because they needed the money, but because they wanted to, this is Zale lecturing Jake, wanted to assure that when they passed on, the next generation would have a value and not have to argue about what it's worth. So 
go public and your shares will give your heirs proper value. First. Absolutely. Okay, so I think that was the motivation for taking commercial level public and it went over the counter mm -hmm. first yep. for many years uh, and it was at that time that the brokerage firm that, that took them public yes. was Epler, Guerin and Turner. Uh -huh. was a local firm. Yep. And Jake became very friendly with with John Turner. Yes. The major major mover of that company. And John said, Jake, you don't have enough executives. It's just you and one other guy. You and and Tom Climber. You have no office. You have no succession. If you really want to grow, you're going to need the bankers to lend you or whoever you borrow from. And with no succession, they're not going to trust you. You better have some offices. So some. Here, here am I. I think it was 1966 or 67. So you've been there like 10 I've years? Been there, no, I've been, Eight. I've been in Dallas six or seven years. 1960 you came. Uh, and uh, Jean Bach, do you remember the Bach family? Of course. Do you remember Jean? Well, he was one of the Bach, the air conditioning Bach and whoever. Okay. And and actually, Tom Kleiman, Jake's treasurer, and yeah. a longtime friend. Tom and Jake had gone to SMU together. Yes. Tom became an accountant. Jake actually took chemistry at SMU, but they were friends. And Tom ended up doing the Feldman family's personal books and then commercial medals. And they were the only officers, he and Tom. So all of a sudden, Jake says, well, who am I going to promote? And he saw me and, he, and Gene Bach. So Jean and I became vice president. I'm sorry, what did Jean Bach do for commercial medals? By then, he, he, Jean had been out of, out of uh, UT. He'd worked at the American Iron in the yard. Jake bought Jake and Kleiman and arranged to buy three scrap yards in Florida. And Jake sent Jean to Jacksonville to basically manage all three. But Eventually, it became such a big operation that Gene managed just the Jacksonville yard and Jake sent other managers for Orlando and Tampa. Got it. Uh, but Gene became a vice president and I became a vice president simply because the letter Turner had, had to show some succession. So that's... So how long were you with Commercial Metals? 45 years. And when did you retire? I, I've... Uh, formally, I retired in 1969-70. Retired? Retired. But I actually no. retired in, in uh, no. March, February, March, 1970. And tell me, what do no, you... No, no, excuse me. 1999-2000. And what have you been doing since then? What have y'all been doing? Well, between those girls, yes, we've had a ball. I really think we have. We've have had, you been traveling? We we started traveling. We we I got very busy. We I, built a house in Wyoming. We, we built a time. house in Wyoming. Oh, you built a house in Wyoming. Yeah. You bought the land. We bought the land. Uh, Wilson, you're not. Are you in Wilson or Jackson Hole? We're in Jackson Hole. Uh, we bought the land. We bought the land in '92 or three. Mm -hmm. Thirty-one years ago. When when we thought we could afford a second home, and we bought the land. We, we it took us two, three years, three years I think, of traveling around the country. 
try to decide where we should. And you like the outdoors? You like the mountain life? Is that what took you there? Well, we had daughters in three different places, one in Atlanta, one in Phoenix, and one in Dallas. And we wanted a place where everybody could get to easily. And we fell in love with the, with the landscape and, and the Of the course. Tetons. And there was a direct flight <laughs> from Dallas to, to Jackson Hole. So we figured, we'll take the kids up for Thanksgiving a couple of years and see how they liked it. Does anybody kids. like to ski? They love to vote. Only our grandson. Just one? Just one. And what's his name? Uh, uh, Eli. Eli and, and just real quick, but, um, before we end, um, tell me your kids' names and uh, who they married and your grandkids' names. I want to get it all on tape. Paula is not married. Right. She's the oldest. Was she ever married? No. Okay. Leah is the middle one. She went to Emory and stayed. <laughs> Fell in love with someone in, in Atlanta. Who? Mark Harrison. And they have how many children? <laughs> they have one boy. Unfortunately, Mark died the year after Eli was uh, bar mitzvahed. What happened to him? He had a massive heart attack and dropped dead. In his 40s? Yeah. Wow. And your and daughter stayed in Atlanta with Eli? She stayed in Atlanta. Um, he was a part of a big family and they were very close and they were all in the area. Well, most of them were. Um, and your other she child? She with Michael and she, she, she just remarried last year. I remember y'all went to the wedding. Yes. Yeah. And who did she marry? Michael Axelrod. Michael Axelrod. Did he have children? He has two grown boys, a little older than What are their Eli. names? That's okay. Uh, and tell me about your third child. And Hannah, <clears throat> Hannah lives in Phoenix. She married um, Scott Goldberg. Okay. Uh, who was a New Yorker and got a job when he graduated from, well, when he got his law degree, had a job out in Arizona, and that's where they met. And they've been in Arizona ever what since. What did he do? He's an attorney. An attorney. And they have children? No children. No children. Lots of dogs. Lots of dogs. Okay, that sounds great. And um, is there anything else y'all would like to add? Any other um, thing that you think I've left out? Just sum it up. We, are, we were lucky to come to Dallas. Lucky to be with Commercial Levels Company. Lucky to be in this community and afforded us to participate. We stayed Jewish. We were able to educate our kids Jewishly. We were able to, are able in our, in our dotage to be somewhat philanthropic. We just have made a good life for ourselves and Dallas permitted us to do that. And tell me about your um Association with Sherith Israel. Well, we, because the Felvins, <laughs> well, you know, they slept us to show. So, early on, uh, I, yeah, we've we, been their members since 19... What positions, since what? 1960. Uh, tell me your positions held at Sherith. None. Well, I was, we don't even have a men's club anymore. I was, in the early six, middle 60s, I was president of Brotherhood. Brotherhood, Terry, Sisterhood. Terry. Were you involved in the Sisterhood at Sheriff? Yeah. And she was either vice president or president of Naomit and Mizrahi and mm -hmm. miserable women and whoever. Never, never Mizrahi. Uh, so we were busy because our kids were there. Israel and, Bonds was my favorite. Israel Bonds. Yeah. So Jake, Jake kept you involved. Well, I think he showed us how. I do want to show a picture of you uh, as a vice president at Sheriff Israel in the Brotherhood. 
That's Stanley Charlie, your father. Well, I, I'm not showing that right this second, but um, Bert, you were vice president under my father. Yes. Stanley Joe Sheps, who um, was also very involved in he was. everything, the JCC, the Federation, Sheriff Israel. Unfortunately, he died early uh, at 44 years old in a plane crash. But um, he did what he did in his short life. And, um, and our, girls were, our girls were all members of Jenny Sheps. Jenny Sheps, so was I. Yes, of course. That's so nice. I didn't know they were all, all in that. That's so nice. Okay, well, um, Dallas has been very lucky to have y'all part of our community. And um, 1960 is a long time. That's 63 years you've been here. Is it 63? Yeah. 63 years. Almost 64. Yeah, almost 64. And you're living now at um, the, the Legacy. Legacy. The town park. And you've made a lot of friends here, or you knew a lot of people? We, we were surprised how many people we didn't know. And what became very apparent here was how tribal the Jewish community is. I think, I think the Sheriff people and the Temple people live a different life. Even here? Even here. Well, not so much. Not so much here. We, we've, we, we're roping them in. I think Terry and I play a fairly important part here in terms of the social uh, ambience. Uh, I think it's very important. I think besides this being a, a, a beautiful facility, it's a social element for us older people. The, the environment keeps us active. And what is your home like here? Uh, is it an apartment? We have an apartment. We're very comfortable here. It's nice. And um, uh, when did you move in? We've been here two and a half years. Wow, that's so nice. Yeah. Robert Romberg was a mentor at Booker T. Um, what years? I think it was like 2003 to 2010. And Commercial Metals was very involved with Booker T. Early on. Yes, Early on. I, they donated they, all we, the metal to the welding department, yeah, right? And we, and we provided an annual exhibition space where the kids would display the best of their year's work. Which is still going on. It's still going on, yes. Who, who started that? Uh, well, it was my responsibility for a while, but who started it was David, they, our, our then uh, corporate attorney and his wife, David, what's the name? Holly. <laughs> Holly and David, I'd have to look it up. They, they were part of the young executives group of, in Dallas. They persuaded that group to sort of sponsor the, the art. They lasted for a couple of years, but, the, but the, it started with commercial because they asked us to let the kids come into the yard and pick their raw material. So that's how it started, and it grew from there. And then... Sudbury. Sudbury, uh, David Sudbury. And then, and then uh, for one or two years, the DMA picked it up, and some of the some of the uh, best works each year would show up at the Dallas Museum of Art. Uh huh. We have one little piece upstairs that we paid, I think, fifteen bucks for. That was on exhibition at the DMA, and I remember it because. Uh, it had 
we, we lent it to the DMA and it had our name on. And I tell Ruben, had been to the DMA and she called me, oh, Bert, you've got this lovely little piece in, in, in the museum. How did you get it? Do you remember Idel Raven? Yes. Yeah. And we have it up on our porch right now. And who's the artist? Who's the sculptor? Oh, some young man. I... I've got his card up there. It's, a, it's on. <laughs> Did he stay in the business or move on? I have no idea. He okay. Was kind of, he was kind of flighty, if I remember. He, he couldn't... He did some welding and then he did some more artwork and he, he was looking at the moon and he, everything he expected, everything that he ever made to be sold for millions of dollars and, and he just kind of flaky. I knew I went to Gail Saxon's apartment yeah. and she had a ton of sculptures and items that she had bought at the Commercial Metals. What did they call it? The Commercial Metals? Um, Scrap can be Scrap beautiful. Can be beautiful. Scrap can be beautiful. That's exactly right. And they're still doing it today. Yes. And, um, and so tell me about your mentors. Gail was one of the judges. Uh -huh. I went on monthly bus trips with her for years. Gail says. I love Gail. I, she was just honored by the Dallas Historical Society this past month. Good. And I went. It was at the Fairmont. Mm -hmm. So anyway... <laughs> So we have a few pieces upstairs, and we have one self-portrait of a young woman at the center of our living room. An oil painting? Yep. It's a very plain jam, but it's very striking. But yeah, we, I had maybe altogether five mentees that over eight years that I... You met with them monthly, right? Weekly. Weekly. Oh, uh, when they would remember, <laughs> which was, in, in itself was a problem. But this young woman was, well, she was a youngster. No, she was. She was a sophomore. She she was just excellent, excellent work habits. Uh, we got her into the University of Chicago, undergrad. Uh, we got her some summer. Her first summer job was we got her through family service who placed her with the Arboretum as a counselor, as a counselor for summer. summer kids tours. So you did that for your mentees? Yes. Wow. Did you, did, Terry, did you ever go uh, to Booker T and do well, any? I, I, Sure, I've been to Booker T several times. No, I know, but did you help out with mentoring or anything? What, what I did with them, I, and I think they picked up on it, and I, I realized that these kids, particularly the ones that are on sort of scholarships, mm -hmm. have some kind of talent, but many of them don't have... Social. At anybody's, but particularly a child whose aspirations are only as high as their horizon. And if their family background doesn't allow them to peak above the horizon, they haven't got a chance. So with my kids, what I did, I lined them up with my friends. Paul, my attorney. They don't have the connections. They don't know what, what's my, available to them. Listen to this. I'm in. This youngster that I got, she was she had a pretty soprano voice, but she's a little girl, and and she likes singing. And her her music teacher, her voice teacher, got along very well with her. And they did gigs, they were, she t sent them up to North Park to sing carols and stuff right. like that. But her family probably, and I don't know this for sure, but I think it's because of her music teacher, uh, her family said, you ain't gonna be nothing singing, you can't, you're too little, you, you better learn typing or something. So the, 
music instructor said, let's get this kid some support, somebody to help her do what she's good at. So they called me, so I took her on, and, and I took her around, took her to my stockbroker. And he said, wait a minute, I got better. I got a girl down below that's a musician, she does gigs, but she can't make a living at doing the gigs, so she's a stockbroker. Let her talk to her. It's the same, same idea. She did that. And then we had a neighbor at the condo where we lived at the time, who was an American Airlines captain. Mm -hmm. And he had friends. And I said to him, Jim, I've got this black kid who needs a little encouragement. Can you introduce her to some of your more metropolitan friends? And sure enough, the, his wife's best friend was a black woman who was a chief of the of the reservation system, Americans. Saber? American Airlines. A dynamo. Saber, Saber. Yeah, a human dynamo. And she met this lady. And then this guy had, a, this captain had a niece who was actually a physician, a black physician at Portland. It no, opened, UT. It, it opened the world to her, you know. And then when it came, to make a college choice. She did, she did this on her own. She found a, or somehow got in touch with an outfit called Questbridge. I know Questbridge. And they gave her a fantastic scholarship. Funny enough that they had been, they had been charting her. They knew who she was because she, she graduated number seven at UT. At uh, uh, Booker T. Yeah. Booker T. And and they I, they must keep all of these kids in a, a rank a ranking or whatever it was. But they had been tra they had been trying to get in touch with her and hadn't been able to. And when she got in touch with them, they said, "Oh, there you are." <laughs> so what they did, they gave her the choice. She says, "You can pick ten schools as your preference." And whichever one accepts you first, you have to accept. Mm -hmm. Because we're going to make room for other kids. Uh -huh. The University of Chicago took her immediately. So she did that. And then she eventually got into Southwestern. She's a cardiologist. I, wanted, I, I was disappointed. She just got a, got a fellowship in Denver. I wanted her to come here and take care of me because my cardiologist and I don't get along anymore. <laughs> well, there's a bunch to choose from here. <laughs> That's really interesting. Yeah. You've, had, you've, you've been an integral part of so many people's oh, that, lives. That was so gratifying. I, I did a couple of others there that didn't work out that well, mostly because or maybe not quite zero, but a little more than zero, or some of them, no family support at all. They had families, but the families didn't know or didn't care. So I couldn't. Anyway, that's the book of tea. Good experience. Thank you so much. Okay.